Welcome to another episode of CattleCast, presented by Capital Area District Libraries. It's the podcast that provides a nice mix of information and entertainment. Welcome to our June episode of CattleCast. I'm Mark Bazita, Library Assistant at Cattle Downtown Lansing. A big congratulations goes out to Sherry Garcia, our May Keyword Contest winner. By submitting the keyword agent, she has won a Kindle Fire. Stay tuned for this month's keyword, which is sponsored by The Lion King, which is coming to Wharton Center in July. We have a special guest who has dropped by our studios, Cattle Executive Director Scott Dimstra. Hi, Scott. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. I just wanted to stop by and share with your listeners uh, some information regarding our millage vote. Yes, absolutely. The uh, renewal vote is on August 7th, and and what it does is it provides 90% of our funding. So the rate is 1.56 mils. It's a term for four years, Mm -hmm. and it is not a tax increase. It's actually just a renewal of our operating millage, which goes to fund our materials, technology, and staffing. And again, that vote is on August 7th. If any... uh, individuals visit our branches they're going to see information materials for this and then a lot of science in the branches as well okay that sounds great and hey while you're here tell us about the three new story walks that are out there sure we have one that opened up on the river trail in lansing Uh, we're also going to have one at msu's children's garden and then also in hawk island the ingham county park they're going to have one as well hey that sounds great yeah Can you give us an update on the Williamston Library? Sure. The Williamston branch, they're in the process of moving. Uh, They're actually going to double the size of their space for the library, so it's going to be fantastic. Uh, They're set to open on Monday, June 25th, and then we'll have a a grand reopening event on Tuesday, July 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. Busy summer. It is very busy. And while you're here, we should plug the other podcast, the Executive Edition podcast that you host. And yep. You want to tell us about that? Sure. It's uh, It's been going along fantastic. My most recent episode, I interviewed uh, Meridian Township Supervisor Ron Steika and then also CATA CEO Brad Funkhauser. He talks a lot about some of the new initiatives that CATA is having for their buses. Scott Dreimster, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Have a great summer. Well, coming up, a great interview for you Prince fans and a big announcement about our Library of Things collection and lots more on CattleCast. If you're staying in town, summer doesn't get any easier than Capital Area District Libraries. Our exciting events will entertain the family with music, magic, and more. Stroll through a cattle story walk at a local park or borrow items like lawn games and musical instruments from our Library of Things. Win great prizes just by tracking your reading time. This summer, we have everything you need right here. Right here. Capital Area District Libraries. It's been two years since legendary singer and musician Prince Rogers Nelson died at the age of 57. While his legacy lives on through an impressive catalog of music, the Paisley Park Museum is also providing fans with an unprecedented opportunity to experience what it was like for him to create, produce, and perform inside this private sanctuary. Joining me now on CattleCast is Mitch McGuire, who is the Tour Operations Manager for the Paisley Park Museum in Chanhassen, Minnesota. Welcome, Mitch. How are you? Good, thanks. So first, tell us, how did you become associated with the museum? Well, you know, I moved to Minneapolis uh, six years ago now from New York City, and as someone who was a lifelong Prince enthusiast, though I had seen Prince play other places over time, One of my goals was to have an opportunity to see him play at Paisley Park. So over the course of that time period, I I went out here to Paisley as often as I could to see him play, and those were moments I wouldn't trade for the world. Uh, But, of course, two years ago, once he passed and I realized that they were going to turn Paisley into a museum, I knew I wanted to try to play a role in some way if I could. So they, you know, literally had uh, a job fair for the Paisley Park Museum, and I went down there and applied, and I actually started as a tour guide. But over the course of time, uh, I was able to uh, be promoted to the point now where I'm the tour operations manager. And, you know, I just feel really, really fortunate to be playing a role now in terms of how we shape his legacy going forward. Why did Prince name the complex Paisley Park? Uh, You know, it's a good question. And to be perfectly honest with you, there are some questions that really don't have a lot of answers because Prince was a very enigmatic artist. Um, you know, he was definitely someone who was comfortable with 
letting his admirers kind of question who and what it was that he did. And I think to some degree, you know, the term Paisley Park falls in line with that. Uh, of course, it was a song that he had on his 1985 album, Around the World in a Day. So it was something he was thinking about prior to building Paisley. But at the end of the day, I mean, Prince really was an artist who was interested in more than just music and film, but it was also fashion and technology. And with Paisley Park, he then had a building in which he could do all of it under one roof. So I think to a large degree, that term for him was a metaphor because Paisley's can take on a lot of different shapes and colors. Now he had a building in which he could do everything he was interested in under one roof. The term park with Baisley Park, I think, really just refers to his own personal playground. And that's definitely what he had here. Right. Now, it could have easily been located in New York or California. Why Minnesota? Well, you know, Prince was born and raised here in Minneapolis. And though he did live other places over time, uh, Paisley Park especially was always home base for him. And I think, you know, he began to develop uh, a relationship with the folks in this community here. They certainly knew who he was and gave him the respect and the privacy that he deserved. And in turn, I just think he chose to stay. Um, You know, he was certainly a very gracious individual in that he would invite perfect strangers into his home here at Paisley and play shows for them. So he definitely appreciated the community. And I think to a large degree, that's why we felt his loss here a little differently than those around the world, because he really was one of our own. And uh, there was something really comforting about knowing he was just down the road creating some really special stuff. Did Prince always intend for Paisley Park to become a museum? You know, he did. Uh, He actually did have conversations with folks close to him about Paisley being a museum one day to the scale that it is now. Uh, But in fact, he even offered up tours to a limited degree when he was here, going all the way back to the early 2000s when he would host what he called celebration events. And he would open up the facility for some tours, showcase some wardrobe pieces, instruments, that type of thing. And then usually those evenings would culminate with musical performances. But even these last few years, you know, uh, Prince would host what he called Paisley Park After Dark events. You know, there would always be DJs playing music, but on a great night, he'd be playing music himself. But then he would offer up uh, tours of the recording spaces, the studios. And so it was something that was always important to him. And he realized how important it was to the folks who were coming out here, how interested they would be in seeing it. Now, I understand there's a mutual connection between Graceland and Paisley Park. Can you tell our listeners what that is? Well, essentially, Graceland Enterprises serves as the corporate umbrella for a company called P Park Management, which is really the organization tasked with managing the day-to-day here at Paisley. And so there are a number of employees that have shared responsibilities between the two entities, uh, but that's really uh, the connection Though, of course, the institutions, Graceland and Paisley Park, are two very different things because the artists themselves were very different. So, though there may be some shared management, uh, the experiences that you'll get are each uh, are, are vastly different. But two musical legends, for sure. So, what yeah. types of things can visitors see and do on the tour? Well, we have several different uh, tour offerings. Uh, there's a general admission tour, which lasts about an hour, and you'll see many of Prince's creative spaces on that tour. There's a VIP tour package in which it lasts about an hour and a half. You'll see some additional rooms, including Prince's Editing Bay and and another recording studio. But then we have what's called the Ultimate Experience, and that's actually a three-hour tour. You'll see parts of the facility you wouldn't see on any other tours. You're going to see some content that you wouldn't otherwise see as well, and, of course, a whole lot more information. But then on that tour, uh, that actually culminates with a meal um, based off of a menu with some of uh, Prince's favorite foods that were designed by a couple of his personal chefs. Uh, When you come to Paisley on a Sunday and you buy a VIP ticket, you also get a Sunday brunch included with that. And then we have, again, what we call Paisley Park After Dark events, usually about twice a month. You can come hang out in Prince's MPG Music Club and listen to a DJ spin some Prince music all night long. Wow, that sounds great. Now, do we know how many albums were recorded at Paisley Park? You know, that's another great question, which unfortunately not an easy one to answer when you consider not only all the albums that Prince recorded here, the studio releases, but also the records that he ended up shelving and putting in the vault. But then you couple that with all the other artists who've been through here over time recording works of their own. Um, it makes makes it so, sort of a tough question to answer, but I would say well 
into the hundreds, you know. Um, but I think it's part of what makes Paisley so interesting is just this very vast, prolific nature of creativity that took place here over the years. And I'm sure all the people that come through are not only fans, but have their favorite songs uh, or favorite albums. What's what's your favorite album? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. And, and to some degree, I feel like it's almost asking a parent to choose their favorite child because there's <laughs> so many great songs and records that came out of here. Hard for me to pinpoint, but I would say that probably my favorite Prince era would be the 90s. Uh, which is a, a particularly interesting time for him because this is when he was beginning to break away from his uh, recording contracts with Warner Brothers. This is when he went from being Prince to being that unpronounceable symbol. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand quite what was going on during that time period, and I think as a result sort of fell away from his work to some degree. But it was at this time that I felt like he was doing some of his most interesting work to date. And so I really love a lot of those records that he was turning out during that time. Now, where can people find out more information on the Paisley Park Museum? Well, they can visit www.officialpaisleypark.com. When you visit that website, not only will you get tour information, but you will also get pricing information as it relates to those tours, tour availability, and there's also a section in there in which you can check out some merchandise as well. That sounds great. Mitch, thanks for joining us today on Cattlecast. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's Mitch McGuire, Operations Manager for Prince's Paisley Park Museum. And this is the Cattlecast Podcast. It's summer reading at Capital Area District Libraries, and we're cranking up the volume with the theme, Libraries Rock. Sign up the entire family and start earning great prizes. Plus, a chance to see School of Rock, the musical at Wharton Center. Get started at cadl.org slash summer. Also enjoy Cattle's cool events. Summer Reading is sponsored by MSU Federal Credit Union, Lansing State Journal, WKAR, WILX, and WFMK. Julie Hamlin is the Senior Associate Director of Public Service and joins us now on CattleCast. Hey, Julie. Hello, Mark. So I understand you have a big trip coming up. I do have a big trip. I'm going to Israel in just a couple days. Wow. Yeah. It's going to be, I, I know, a long and direct flight. So I am packing up some of my favorite reading to get going mm-hmm. um, for sure. And the library can certainly help with the that in, in print does. and digital forms definitely, and all of that. Definitely. Oh, that's exciting. Well, have fun with that trip. Thank you. And we're right in the middle of the summer reading program, yeah. Libraries Rock. Libraries Rock, indeed. Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about that and some of the special things going on. Okay. Well, summer reading is always a really fun time, I think, at the library. Uh, lots of energy. It uh, takes a lot to get it off the ground. Right. Um, But it's something we all look forward to at the library quite a bit. We always have our regular battery of like lots of uh, magic shows, variety shows, puppets, animals. We just had a great fun picture the other day on social media of the new branch head at the Leslie Library with, I I don't know, some little fuzzy, furry, cute (laughs) animal. So that's a great time. But um, this year, obviously, with the library's rock theme, we are doing some special related programs for that too right. and one of them is the petting zoo yes tell the musical petting zoo right. tell us about that yeah so usually when people think of a petting zoo they obviously think of animals but we are having some fun with being able to let folks get up close with instruments and touch them maybe sort of try them on for size we're working with martial music on that at several of our branches so that's that's a really fun program and there's another one with ukuleles yes so ukuleles are just all the rage i probably we don't need to tell anybody that. There's a bunch of different types of ukulele programs that we have. We have a great summer concert coming up later in the summer with ukulele night at Veterans Memorial Gardens with the Holt Delhi branch. But then we're also working with Psy Music Studios from Old Town in Lansing. She's going around to many branches and we'll have ukuleles for kids to touch to kind of get used to a couple strings to learn a little bit about the history of ukuleles. We have some singing strums throughout the cattle family, so a lot of fun with ukuleles. And we have um, some instruments that you can check out with our library of things also now. Absolutely. And there's something called Not Your Everyday Instruments. Yes, what What a fun um, series this is at the South Lansing Library. 
Doretha Fields. Uh, my understanding is she is a retired teacher from the area, and a lot uh-huh. of people fondly remember her as Mrs. Fields. She'll be playing like classic harp, a euphonium later in the summer. Does anybody even know what that is? I do because my son played that for a while, but some people don't. <laughs> Bagpipes later in the summer. Yeah. Sounds really fun to me. That's great. And it's such a nice opportunity for kids, especially that maybe have never seen these instruments up close. They can they can see them, they can touch them, they can maybe even play some of them and, and really get a better uh, understanding of, yes, of the music world. Definitely. So, very definitely. exciting. Yeah. So good stuff there. One other thing, tell us about the Read Off Finds program that's going okay. on now through the end of the month. Well, sure. Let me back up a little bit, too, and just say, like, about summer reading in general. I mean, we always try to make it really fun because what an opportunity. As a public library, we want to provide free activities for families to come to and some opportunities to maybe get out of the heat, to try something out. We, we try to make it really fun and engaging and be, be a community resource for folks. But at the same time, there's, like, science and there's behind the summer reading. Right. We really do all of this to help with preventing like what's called the summer slide. Mm-hmm. Uh, kids, when they are out of a school environment for a couple of years, if they're not reading, it can actually kind of back up their learning um, if they're not in- engaged with like that written word. Many studies show that you know you keep them reading, that helps them. Then when they go back to school in, in September or August, they're more engaged and ready to learn and on grade level. So that's really why we do summer reading even though there's all this fun around it so this read off the fines is a program that we're trying this year i mean a lot like fines are in place in part to kind of keep items going you know kind of encourages people to return items and we want to be able to make sure that we can get them to the next person on the list who wants to use them but at the same time they can be a hindrance to to anybody and kiddos in particular because it's so important for them to stay on point with their literacy we are doing a program this year where kids can actually read off their fines. Um, If they read for um, a certain amount of time, they get some fines waived from their library account. And then if that was something that was preventing them from signing up for summer reading, that that preventative is like removed. And even better yet, if you actually read in the library, you earn double the points and double the ability to, to waive some fines. You can go into any of our branches and find out more information about that. An important thing to note is that that only um, runs for the month of June. Mm-hmm. So we're about halfway through that month of June. So you want to get into the library, sign up for summer reading, which you can do at, online also at cattle.org and get those fines waived and get going. That sounds good. And all that information, all the programs and events are listed on cattle.org yes. as well. And one last thing, talk about the Meet Up and Eat Up program that's going on for the summer months at the downtown and South Lansing libraries. Sure. You can go to those libraries, check in with them. There's different days of the week that they have a lunch provided primarily for kids, but there's different activities that are going on there. And it just makes sure that like young ones enjoy a meal together. That sounds great. So good food and good programs and great fun all summer long at Capital Area District Libraries. Yes, thank all you, All right, Mark. Jolie, thanks for being with us thank today. Thank you. And you're listening to CattleCast. <music> Jessica Goodrich is Cattle's business, outreach, and library of things librarian and joins us now on CattleCast. Hey, Jessica. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So we want to talk a little bit more about the Library of Things collection. This has been around now at Cattle for about two years or so. But for those who don't know, tell us in general, what is the Library of Things? Well, the Library of Things is a non-traditional collection where people can borrow actual things. Things like sewing machines, metal detectors, GoPro cameras, All different sort of items that can help you around your house, that can help encourage you to learn new things, be creative. The idea is you can try something out. Maybe you'll decide to buy it. Maybe it's just something that you've been wanting to fiddle with. Or maybe it's something that you can just always borrow from the library when you need. And there's no cost to this. No, everything is completely free to check out with your cattle card. Wow. So now that summer's here, I understand there are some outdoor games that are part of the Library of Things collection. Tell us about those. Last year, we had cornhole, ladder ball, bocce ball. Mm -hmm. Well, we still have those, but we've added some to it. We have added washer toss. 
which apparently is not as popular cornhole around Michigan, but it's still really awesome. Mm -hmm. It's the one where you have the box and the PVC pipe and you're trying to throw them into the box or PVC pipe. And we've also added Giant Jenga, which is huge. It comes in a big duffel bag and you can actually stuff it. You can pile it up to over five feet tall. Wow, sounds like fun. Tell us about, is it called the Color Muse? Yes. What is that? Well, it's this gadget that we found online and I kind of fell in love with. It is this little, small, two-inch cylinder. You install an app to work with it. It's iOS or Android. And you can color match anything to the paint color. The Color Muse will tell you, you hold up the Color Muse to whatever item you want to color match. And on your app, it will tell you what paint colors match. And wow. it doesn't go by any brand. It suggests multiple brands, everything. It's really fun to play with. So for somebody like me that's colorblind, this may be the perfect <laughs> thing exactly. to check out, right? <laughs> I can match my clothes in the morning. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> <Nice>. All right. <laughs> Well, we talked uh, about our summer reading program earlier and our theme of Libraries Rock. So the Library of Things collection has added some musical instruments to the collection, right? Of course. We just couldn't resist. <laughs> Perfect theme, and we just had to add some instruments. Uh, we really talked to some patrons, and then we talked to some local businesses. We ended up working with Music Manor in South Lansing, They've been awesome. They really helped us walk through their store and figure out what things would be good for beginners and things that could, you know, hold up to being borrowed in our delivery. And we picked out some great instruments to add to the collection. We're really excited. We've got some things like an acoustic guitar. Wow. We also have a three-fourth size guitar, which is called a Darling Diva. If you're short like me or a kid... <laughs> It's amazing. You can actually get your arms around it and play. We added a banjo, which personally, I had never interacted with a banjo in real life. Mm -hmm. It is so much fun. It's a blast. <laughs> we have an electric guitar and little mini amp that goes with it, and they check out together for you. Mm -hmm. Please don't rock out like Marty McFly, but you know, <laughs> still have some fun. We have a cajon. Which most people, that? most people have no idea. It is a percussion instrument. If you've ever gone to open mic nights or poetry jams and you see the thing that somebody's sitting on and playing and it's like a drum, that's a cajon. We have some shore microphones and stands. Those actually come with both the regular hookup and the hookup to hook up to your computer. A lot of times you don't get the mic to hook up to the USB. We actually have that cord in there too. We have some ukuleles, both concert and soprano, and even some keyboards. And all the instruments come with kind of some primary beginner books. They're in the cases or attached to it somehow. People can really get started with them. So you could get a whole band formed here over Almost, the summer months, yeah. right? That's very cool. Well, again, for people who don't know, tell us how this checkout procedure works. Like you can search all of these items on our catalog page, cattle.org and see and type in library of things and see the full collection of items is that right yes okay there'll be a few other things in our catalog because obviously it's a keyword search if you also go to cadl.org mm -hmm. forward slash things you can actually see a page with all the things listed out each item has an additional information link so that way you can see manuals see a picture of the item what's included or the checkout link so that you can just put it on hold Everything comes back to our central library so we can maintain it, clean it, make sure it's working, all those things so that when you get it, you're actually getting a good item and everything is good with it. Right. So all you have to do is put a hold on it, and then it comes out with you in our delivery trucks within a couple of days. Okay. And how long do these items check out for? Two weeks. Two weeks. That's perfect. Just enough time to get a few music lessons in and play a few games. Who knows what? Exactly. All right. The Library of Things, the ever-growing collection of Library of Things. Jessica Goodrich, thank you for joining us today. Before you go, we want you to give this month's cattle keyword. Lion. Lion. All right. So... Email this month's cattle keyword, lion, L-I-O-N, to connect at cattle.org for your chance to win tickets to Disney's The Lion King, which is coming to Wharton Center July 11th through the 29th. Jessica Goodrich, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. To celebrate Capital Area District Library's 20th birthday, 
we're giving CattleCast listeners a chance to win great prizes, like a Kindle Fire or a pair of tickets to see The Lion King. Just listen for the special keyword during new episodes of CattleCast. When you hear it, email it to connect at cadl.org, along with your contact information. Winners will be announced during the following month's episode. Each month, a new keyword will be announced, so keep listening to the CattleCast podcast. School's out, so it's time to hit the road. My next guest will share with us how your library card can save you money on trips to state parks and cultural attractions. Let's welcome Library Network Technical Services Manager Jim Flurry to CattleCast. Hi, Jim. Hi, Mark. How's everything going in Lansing this afternoon? We're doing great, thanks. So, Jim, what's the Library Network? Sure. The Library Network is a public library cooperative. We're based in uh, in, in Novi, in, in Metro Detroit here, and we provide a variety of services to our 75 member libraries. Automation services, technical services, delivery, a, a whole bunch of things that, that assist our member public libraries in providing service in turn to their patrons. We do a lot of the back office functions on behalf of our libraries. And now let's talk about the Michigan Activity Pass. Tell us how someone's library card can save them money at a state park or a cultural attraction. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, the Michigan Activity Pass program, or MAP, MAP as, as we often refer to it as, it's a collaboration between every public library in the state of Michigan, which is approximately 400 libraries in about 640 separate buildings, nearly 450 cultural and state park attractions, state recreation areas. The Michigan Activity Pass, which library patrons can access by having their handy dandy library card saves you money sometimes it's free admission to cultural attractions sometimes it's discounted admission it's all across the board it's a great program so how do you check out an activity pass and then do you need to return it it's an all online program so you can reserve your pass right from the privacy of your own home you can use your mobile device for it. First, you have to have a library card. I want to emphasize that. So get to your library and get your library card because MAP's a good benefit and a whole bunch of other things that you can get. You want to start with michiganactivitypass.info. That's the URL we're going to use, michiganactivitypass.info. And we have a tutorial on the MAP site. Follow the tutorial. It'll walk you through all of the steps to check out a MAP pass, print it, take it with you to the venue. There's no need to return it. That's, that's the beauty of it. You don't need to bring it back to the library with you. Just print and go. That sounds really easy. Now, are there any restrictions the one restriction that we have is the, the, the passes are good for seven days. So we ask that when you print a pass that you use it within the seven-day period. Every one of the destinations that is a partner of ours, and as I said, there are nearly 450 of them around the state, they set the terms in terms of uh, free admission or discounted admission or maybe maybe a discount in the gift shop. And so we like, we like to thank our partners for them for their generosity in terms of working with this on their program. So sometimes each venue will sometimes have a different discount terms, but really the only restriction is we ask that you use that pass within that seven-day period. Now, what are some of the popular attractions for people living in the greater Lansing area? I did a search on our MAP, uh, MichiganActivityPass.info website, and I searched for all of the MAP attractions that are available within 50 miles of the downtown branch of Capital Area District Libraries, and I came up with 46 destinations. Some of the most popular ones that we've seen over the years when we look at the statistics include the R.E. Olds Transportation Museum there in Lansing. The Michigan Historical Museum, of course, is always popular. Sleepy Hollow State Park is, is another one. The Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame, which recently, not that long ago, moved into the mall, is, is popular. Oh, the Howell Conference and Nature Center has is, is been a popular map attraction for, for many years. And as I said, I found 46 
map destinations within 50 miles of downtown Lansing. So there really is something for everybody in this program. If people go to michiganactivitypass.info, can they plug in distance, like you had said, you know, 50 miles, or can you say within a certain distance or a certain zip code, or how does that part work? The software works best if you enter your starting zip code. Where are you? Are you at your home? Are you in the library? Where are you? And and when you plug in that here's where I'm starting, zip code works best, you then have the option to determine, well, how many miles do I want to drive? And the default mileage will be 25, but you can change that to 10 miles, 25 miles, 750 miles if you want to see everything in Michigan. Michigan's a big state, Copper Harbor in the north, uh, Monroe in the south, and we've got map attractions in both of those places and every place in between. And then, of course, we want to tell the software, what is our home library? We want the library to get credit for all the hard work they put into promoting the program. And then when you click search, it will give you a list of all of the destinations that are within that mileage range that you specified in how far do I want to go. And is this a program that is running just during the summer months, or does this run all year long? MAP runs year-round. This is the 11th year we've been doing this. It started as a Metro Detroit-only program, and it was so popular that we expanded it to the entire state of Michigan. Summertime is our most popular time for the MAP program. Um, It runs year-round, but a lot of our most popular summer attractions are the state parks and state recreation areas and state forest campgrounds, all of which we're glad to offer free admission with a map pass. They're very, very popular, in, in particularly in the summer. They, they do see some usage in the winter months, but a map definitely is a year-round program. We have a lot of great indoor attractions that get heavy usage during the cooler months as well. Well, I think I've got some traveling to do right now, so I better get going here. But <laughs> for more information on the, on the Michigan <laughs> Activity good. Pass, right, uh, and a complete list of supported venues and participating libraries, once again, visit michiganactivitypass.info. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the time. That's Jim Flurry, Technical Services Manager for the Library Network, and you're listening to Catherine. Right here. Even on vacation, summer doesn't get any easier than Capital Area District Libraries. Take us along on your trip by downloading or streaming free books, movies, and music from our digital collection. Check out a pass to get discounted admissions and other exclusive offers at attractions across the state. Win great prizes just by tracking your reading time. This summer, we have everything you need right here. Right here. Capital Area District Libraries. Dollars and Cents is brought to you by the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. We welcome back Ian Oberg, MSU FCU Senior Financial Educator, back to CattleCast to discuss some ways to reduce debt. Hey, Ian. Hey. Welcome back. So how's your summer going? It's going pretty well. I've been filling a little bit of time with going to a few concerts. I actually have one coming up a little bit later this month. Oh, yeah? Uh, I'm going to Oakland, California, actually, to see one of my favorite bands, Bella and Sebastian, a theater in Oakland. I entered a contest online to win tickets uh, back in January and promptly forgot about it and (laughs) received a phone call uh, about a month ago letting me know that I had won tickets. So No kidding. Yeah, did a little bit of creative budgeting, uh, figured out, a way to make airfare work, so I'm going out there for a few days. I get to stay with a former coworker, so lodging and you know those amenities are taken care of, and I get to see one of my favorite bands. Well, so that kind of leads us into what we wanted to talk about today, the difference between good debt and bad debt. Not that this concert necessarily will bring you into debt, but you said you had to do some creative you know, planning financially to be in, in shape for this, but tell us about the difference between the good and the bad debt. Absolutely. And uh, touching back on the concert, uh, I tried to do some creative budgeting because I didn't want to use a credit card to pay for the airfare. I wanted to make sure that I could just take care of that because honestly, good and bad debt, it's difficult to kind of differentiate between the two because owing anyone money can be stressful. So it could be said that any debt is bad, but really the concept behind the difference is that good debt has a higher purpose or a longer term benefit. Something like 
like an auto loan gives you a car that gives you the ability to get to a job and you can generate income easier, but you have transportation. Student loan debt, I definitely have my own personal complaints about my student loan debt, but at the same time, the purpose behind it is to get a higher education for a higher earning potential. And so those could be considered good debt, but on the flip side, bad debt would be something that doesn't have a grander purpose, something like credit card debt, where it may have helped to solve an emergency, which is great, but unless you do that creative budgeting to figure out how to aggressively pay it down, you can get stuck in a loop of interest being applied and only covering the minimum payment that you made. And it's a lot longer to uh, to reduce that debt. Mm -hmm. uh, another form of bad debt, interestingly enough, cars are kind of like... Uh, kind of good and bad because it does have that purpose of giving you transportation to generate income, but cars also depreciate in value much faster. A brand new car depreciates even faster than, say, buying a used car. And so you run the risk of, you know, your your loan amount being more than the actual value of the vehicle, and that's not helping you out. What are some of the most common types of debt? I mean, credit cards and student loans, I would think, would be near the top of that list. Absolutely. Uh, credit cards, student loans, and interestingly enough, medical bill collections. Not necessarily ones that are in current repayment, but ones that may have slipped through the cracks or ones that patients were not able to pay based on, you know, their level of income, how their budget is structured. Sometimes it is simply an inability to, to, to be able to pay those uh, those bills and that becomes a collection which then is almost like a stone weighing down your boat of money mm -hmm. so whether people have the credit cards the student loans the good or the bad debt what are some options to resolve those debts well it's good that there are those options uh, out there and so some of the ones that you can use for various you know depending on what your debt is there are different strategies for example credit card debt there are uh, if you have multiple cards that you're trying to reduce the you know the balance of there's two different strategies uh, one is called the avalanche method and the other is the snowball method and essentially the, the avalanche method uh, involves working on paying just the minimum amount on all of your cards except for the one with the highest interest rate because that's going to generate more debt as time passes. And so you aggressively pay down on the card that has the highest interest rate until that's done, and then you work your way down. Uh, the snowball method is somewhat similar but from a different angle, and you work on reducing and paying off the cards with the lowest dollar amount that you owe. That way you can knock those down and then work your way up to the higher debts. Medical collections, you can essentially do the same thing if there are multiple ones, but sometimes the amount of a single medical collection can be somewhat of a barrier to, to getting that taken care of in a timely manner. And with those things, you might need to contact the collector uh, to discuss a more feasible payment arrangement, something where you are able to pay what you can and they are willing to accept that. And it may take a while to pay that down, but you have it established as part of your budget. Really, with paying off any debts, the first and foremost thing that you want to do is set up your budget so that you know what you have to work with and how much you can put towards paying down those debts. When it comes to student loans, that is a very common debt that a lot of people, including myself, uh, are dealing with. Mm -hmm. But the great thing is there are a lot of resources out there to give you an idea of your options would suggest going to studentloan.gov, or uh, pardon me, studentloans.gov, uh, or ibrinfo.org. And those both have some options that could be more along the lines of pay as you earn, where your student loan debt payments are based off of your income. Uh, in fact, that's what IBR stands for. It's an income-based repayment, and you would apply for that on a yearly basis. And based on your previous year's taxes and your you know gross income, federal government determines a manageable payment amount for you. That way you are at least able to make payments toward it and you're not damaging your credit by not making payments. Mm -hmm. As they're listening today and say, I, I just, I don't even know where to start. I've got so much debt or credit cards, student loans, whatever it may be. What would you recommend is the very first 
beginning step for them? The very first step is to create a budget, or at the very least, if and sometimes the word budget can be a little bit daunting, uh, just start listing out all of your bills and list out your income any and all sources of income, if you have a job, if you're receiving some sort of spousal support or a child support, list all of your sources of income, list all of your expenses, all of the bills that you have to pay, all of your debts, and then figure out once you've got your day-to-day -day expenses, such as you know rent payments, groceries, once those things are taken care of, figure out how much you have to set aside towards paying down those debts, and then, depending on what your debt amount is. Maybe you want to use the snowball method if you don't have a whole lot to uh, you know, put towards it because with that, you can take the small amount you have, pay off the smallest debt, and then that debt's gone. You have a little bit more money in your budget and you can work your way up. But really the first step is to create a budget and get a plan in place for how to pay those down. So there are options out there for people. They just have to begin the process. Absolutely. All right. Ian, thanks for joining us again today. Thank you. That's Ian Oberg from the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. And also check out great titles on personal finance from our Capital Area District Libraries. Visit cadl.org for more information. Thanks for joining us for CattleCast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends and family. Also, check out previous episodes. Our cattle keyword is lion, so submit now to connect at cadl.org for a chance to win tickets to Disney's The Lion King. I'm Mark Bazita. Thanks for joining us.